in a variety of Star City Games events. Taking a look at his particular build, he does have, of course, four Deal of Thassas. He's got three Deal of Heliods, two Aqueous Form, a Stratus Walk. No Heliods Pilgrims. Actually, I take that back. He does have two. Most of the time, he doesn't play any, but he does have two this week, and he has a main deck copy of Stubborn Denial as well. So we haven't seen much heroic here in this particular tournament, but we will see Mize play right now against, again, two-time Grand Prix champion here, John Stern, as we are underway here in round number nine. And setting aside mirror matches, which are kind of their own thing, I think this is the most play-draw-biased matchup in all of Standard. Both of these decks are so much better at playing offense than defense, and so... Uh, the person on the play generally has a pretty big edge. Mize with just a couple of lands to start. Same thing can be said here for Stern. So it does make you wonder if he's missing heroic creature at this point. Well, often this deck against an opening of a, a red basic land will try to not play one of its two drops on turn two and instead play it on the third turn with some degree of protection. So it may indicate that Logan doesn't have a two drop, uh, although often those hands just get mulliganed. It could also mean that he has some degree of protection and doesn't want to tap out on turn two and have something get eaten up by Wild Slash or Lightning Strike or so forth. Well, here's Heliod's Pilgrim. That's going to resolve. Mize is going to go searching. It'll be in a copy of Aqueous Form. We'll be heading back Stern's way here in just a moment. It's interesting to watch this white-blue heroic deck develop because there's so many different enchantments to choose from and so many different threats that for a linear deck in standard with you know a relatively shallow card pool compared to modern, uh, there's still a lot of room to maneuver with this deck and change around card slots. Battlefield Forge is line number three here for John. And now here's a copy of Goblin Rabble Master. Goblin Token will get made. Of course, it'll get blocked by Helios Pilgrim. We're moving right along as might as well take a draw step. And one of the big weapons for Jeskai Tokens in this matchup are the creatures, whether it's Seeker of the Way, whether it's uh, Soulfire Grandmaster, Goblin Rabble Master. The White Blue Heroic deck doesn't really kill stuff. And so these repeated sources of damage, they're very valuable, particularly things like Rabble Master and Seeker of the Way that have a dramatic impact on the damage race. Might as well play a Flooded Strand. Couple copies of Defiant Strike in hand. No sacrifice to Strand right now. So planes are an island on the way, and it will be a planes. Looks like Ben Stark wasn't the only one going through the draft land box. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, they're both from Florida. It just yeah, must, yeah. must be a thing here. <laughs> Stern will take a draw step. And, you know, Logan here not putting Aquas' form on his Heliod's Pilgrim and going to the red zone, daring John to attack with the Rabble Master. I don't think that's going to happen. Unless John is very sure. There's the Goblin token. Stern, of course, playing Shaven Reef beforehand. So now here is Rabble Master. It'll be a three power creature with this attack. Love it. Let's have a showdown. And we're, we're, yes. we're about to. There's a Defiant Strike. The response is Lightning Strike, it seems. Yep. John feels this is a battle he can win. There's a copy of Johnny's presence. Another lightning strike. Stern will have to pay one. Does Mize have a God's Willing or something else? Yep. God's Willing protection for Red. Mize is going to win this war. Yep. He had three tricks to John's two. And this is, the, you're seeing a perfect display of why White Blue Heroic is a very powerful deck. It's a lot of one-mana answers countering a lot of two-mana spells. Mm -hmm. We had a showdown here where John's hand was pretty good. Two copies of Lightning Strike is not bad against an opponent with four mana, but Logan was able to win the battle. Now might as well draw. Picked up a copy of Favorite Hot Place. Now finally he's got a heroic creature because you don't really want to build up the old Heliod's Pilgrim. It's a slow burn. It, it is pretty slow, yeah. There's Favorite Hot Place. I played in FNM with White Blue Heroic a couple months ago and was... Resigned at putting enchantments on Helios Pilgrim. It did not turn out to be a winning game. Yeah, I was going to ask how that worked out for you, but I already knew. Not great. 
There's the favorite hoplite for Mize. Starting with just a goblin token out there. There's Alpo Siege. Not a bad time to take a turn off. Yeah, not a lot going on right now. But this is an opening for Logan to start putting some enchantments on uh, the favorite hoplite, pushing it out of burn range. You have to imagine somebody's looking for an ordeal of Fossa. Now, Logan does, uh, excuse me, John rather, does have two copies of Jeskai Charm in his deck. So it's not necessarily game over if, if Logan's able to push a creature to five toughness, but it's not where John wants to be. Logan going to start with the Defiant Strike here. He'll get the draw. And of course, Trigger Heroic. Now it's Aqueous Form. Trigger Heroic yet again. Now it's time for the red zone. Aqua's form will allow Logan to scry. Keep in mind, with the favorite hoplite, it'll be an attack for four. We'll actually make it six now. Thanks to Defiant Strike giving plus one, plus zero. Oh. And that's that critical point of five toughness. This is unblockable, and if Logan has an answer to Jeskai Charm, John's under pressure to put something together really powerful, really fast. Apo Siege will turn over a Plains. And then Stern will take control. Looks like he's flooding off just a touch here. But it's very hard for him to interact with Favorite Hoplite at this point. He has no enchantment removal in his main deck. So his outs here are Fine Chess Guy Charm or put together two pieces of burn to finish off this Hoplite. And uh, the second plan is very hard to execute if Logan has God's Willing or any sort of protection effect. Turn with a scry here from the temple. A very methodical player. But he's not a two-time Grand Prix champion on accident, that's for sure. He's in my he's on my top five list of, you know, matches where I played really badly and a player better than me was able to capitalize on the mistakes and get me. We had oh, a match in modern. Only five of those? I said top five. Oh, excuse me, okay. <laughs> I, I said sure. top five. I just want to make sure. Clarification is key. I got ultimate with figure of destiny against his all ornithopter deck and somehow. Oh just, boy. Yeah. Take uh, that story to the grave, man. Uh, it doesn't matter, man. I'm, I'm past it. <laughs> Don't tell me about losing with an ultimate figure of destiny. You come to the wrong table with that. Ordeal of Heliod's going to allow Mize to trigger heroic, put some counters on that thing, and of course gain 10 life. And now next turn, we're looking at lethal. Yes, we are. Time for a Jeskai Charm if Stern has one. He's reaching for mana here. There's a raise the alarm. And you know, that's just something that can trade it around here with the old Heliot's Pilgrim. I'm sure Mize doesn't mind that, though. It doesn't really matter here. He's still got a six power creature coming across that he can't block. John's at 11, so uh, this double block's fine, but it doesn't address the problem here. It's answer this hoplite right now, or you're dead. Seeker of the way is the reveal. The draw is Jeskai Ascendancy. That's a powerful card, don't get me wrong. But John Stern needs some help, and he needs to hope that Logan doesn't have a protection spell here. Yeah, I think that John's hand is just two lands on top of the ascendancy he just drew, and that's, uh, that's going to get him nowhere. Logan Mize going to win the game number one here over John Stern. White Blue Heroic up a game over Just Guy Tokens. So we take a look at the sideboard here. We will start with Stern, which you have in front of you. Two copies of Erase, two copies of Glare of Heresy, two copies of Wild Slash, two copies of End Hostilities, three copies of Kerados God of Storms. Four copies of Disdainful Stroke. So even though White Blue Heroic plays a lot of enchantments, I'm not really a fan of a race against them because most of the enchantments do something when they come into play or they're the ordeals that trigger very quickly. So you need to be very timing specific. Glare of Heresy, on the other hand, an excellent answer to the white threats that are in White Blue Heroic. The two Wild Slashes can help John keep up in the early game and the two copies of End Hostility is very good here. If something gets out of control, gives John an out. Other side of things on Mize, he's got 
two Glare of Heresy, two Valor Stance, two Stubborn Denial, three Disdainful Stroke, two Treasure Cruise, two Master of the Unseen. Very popular card this week, and as we mentioned, a Seeker of the Way and an Ordeal of Heliod. I think you want some more creatures in this matchup. I think the Seeker of the Way probably comes in the two copies of Treasure Cruise, helpful against John probably bringing more removal to the table post-board. Two copies of Stubborn Denial, Glare of Heresy, and Valor Stance, all very good for fighting over particular spells, protecting Logan's creatures, or getting Jeskai Ascendancy off the table. Well, these players will shuffle up and get ready for game number two. John Stern will be on the play with his Jeskai Tokens deck. We will talk about what has probably been the most exciting card that has been revealed here over PAX weekend. Not a card from Dragon's Dark here, a card from Magic Origins. That's the brand new Liliana. A little split card action here. We haven't seen split cards since Innistrad, and this is pretty exciting stuff. I, setting aside whatever the power level of this card is, this is just a cool concept. So kudos to the R&D team for coming up with this. Three mana, two, three with lifelink. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you exile Liliana. Then return her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. If you do, you get a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. So already that's pretty sweet. And then it turns into Liliana Defiant Necromancer. Each player discards a card. If you plus two, it starts with three counters. Myas X, return target non-legendary creature card with converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield. And then Myas 8, you get an emblem with whenever a creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of your next end step. There's a lot going on here. Lots to wrap my head around. I'm not going to speculate on the pure power level. It seems, you know, medium high to me. Not an obvious tier one superstar, but solid enough for a constructed level play. But this is just a cool story and the melding of gameplay and flavor is something that the R&D team does much better than at any time during Magic's history. You know, M10 forward has just been a, a great time to be playing Magic. There's so much going on here and I just, I, I, haven't played a, I haven't played a single game with it. We have no idea how powerful it's going to be in the context of whatever format it's going to be in. Just a sweet card. Yeah, this is just sweet. And I hope there are more cards like that in that set. I would have to imagine this is going to be a cycle. Yeah. You know, if you're going to do the opportunity cost of having double-sided cards and the complexity of creatures that turn into planeswalkers and some associated rules baggage, these cards are cool enough where I can't imagine doing the one. You know, so, I would imagine there's at least three, probably five. So there is Liliana. If you missed the announcement in PAX East, there you go. Look forward to that over the summer here for Magic. You know, I use the term uh, a lot, the cost is front-loaded, which is... Most of the cost of doing something like that is the first card because of the complexity and the, the rules package. But once you've done it, the second, the third, the fourth copy, they're not adding that much more complexity. So worth doing once you've done the, the first one. And you know, I remember the first time I saw flip cards when it was in a Strahd. I don't know if it was Delver of Secrets or whatever flip card I saw, but I was skeptical out of the gate. Well, it's one of those things where I think tournament players have a habit of poo-pooing things where it seems like they're going to be a little complicated in tournaments. A lot of people criticize miracles because I had to draw my card differently for the rest of my tournament life and, you know, issues with sleeves and how does draft work. And the checklist cards are not the most elegant solution. But as it turns out, cool gameplay wins out over those kind of logistical hurdles. And so the werewolves and other flip cards of Innistrad definitely worth doing. Miracles definitely worth doing. Uh, turns out that if the cards are sweet, that's kind of what matters the most. And a Shroud Limited is still one of my favorite formats of all time. Oh, it's so deep. So deep. It was so good. Burned a lot of hours playing that format. Wouldn't have it any other way. John Stern going to quickly take a mulligan while Mice takes a look at his opening hand. Remember, this is a win in for day two here, folks. Yep. Can't forget that. Someone's going home. Someone's playing tomorrow. Logan Mai is currently up a game and watching his one mulligan. Might be feeling pretty good. Might be a pretty good matchup here for Logan, too. A lot on the state just besides the, the cash prizes here as well. For a player like John, you know, definitely searching out pro points and, you know, trying to be in a position to maintain his gold status, maybe move on to apply them. And for Logan, uh, a deep run here could qualify him for the Pro Tour. Yep. So uh, no matter what ability level you're at, these Grand Prix have a lot riding on them because they got to be pro points to maintain your silver, gold, platinum level status or an opportunity to play on the Pro Tour. And the 6-2 and two match never stops being stressful. Don't care what level you're at at Magic, these are always stressful matches. If it stops being stressful, you shouldn't be playing. Yep. These are the most fun matches to me. Playing for day two, you want to come back and play tomorrow. Well, by the end of my line, I could take it or leave it, which I guess speaks to your point of it's time, time to, to hang it up. Time to hang it That's up. That's right. Well, my attitude shifted from I'm going to win this to someone's got to win this. 
I think my results started to suffer a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit. Here's, here's a race alarm from John. <laughs> Two soldiers in, Mize with a battle-wise hot play. And I think you're going to see John be very proactive about using removal spells when Logan's tapped out. Because you, you saw what happened in the first game. John doesn't want to get in that song and dance where I'm trying to time my removal spells against your God's willing and other protection effects. So he's got an opportunity here to... You know, let's say stoke the flames and advance his board this turn. I don't think he's going to wait for Logan to untap and try to trap him. Just get it off the table. Well, here's a Rabble Master. There's a Goblin token. And you mentioned stoke the flames. He's going to use that to get that off the table. Good turn there for John. Oh, this is great. And, and again, the Goblin Rabble Master is very hard for White Blue Heroic to answer. They, they have to overpower or trap it in combat. And that's going to be very hard to do with Logan at, at risk of missing a land drop here and with nothing in play. Here, my Rose will come down here for Mize. All he can do is pass the turn back. No third land. Stern, you can see, has a mountain in his hand, so fourth land, not an issue. But we'll see what else he's got here. And you're getting a very good uh, instruction right now through the first two games of why this matchup is so play-draw biased. There's just guy ascendancy. Things are going to heat up here in just a moment. Stern with a pretty good mulligan. <laughs> yep. But the, the matchup is so, so much about, uh, you know, getting out in front of your opponent. People die in this matchup all the time with cards left over in their hand because the games are played so fast. Mm -hmm. And when one deck has its thing going, it's so overwhelming, the other deck can't keep up. So a matchup where you have to ag aggressively mulligan. You, you can't just keep every hand of lands and spells. Mice with the opportunity there to block Goblin Token instead of blocking Goblin Rabble Master. He needs his heroic threat to be able to try to win this game. Yeah, there's no way he can win by trading, especially now with Ascendancy in play. That, that ship has sailed, so he's got to try to get something going and ignore what John's doing. Uh, probably won't work, but it's at least worth trying. Ordeal of Thassa, Ordeal of Heliod. Attack triggers. He's going to gain 10. Peel two. I've seen worse turns. Yeah, I mean, this is the path. You know, you, you, can't, you can't beat John fighting fair at this point. So you've got to try to cheat it by making some huge threat, gaining 10 life a turn, and uh, you may be able to overwhelm him. It's unlikely because John's board is so advanced at this point, but it's your best shot. And hostility is the draw. Little weird. I mean, it's good to sideboard in here, not really where this game's at right now, but though, not necessarily a bad insurance policy. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that or, um, Ordeal of Heliod, three copies of that card in Mize's deck. So we can see him chain together gain tens. Yep. Here's a hoarding outburst. Stern gonna draw and discard here. Temple of Triumph and End Hostilities are the options for the discard. Holding outburst, of course, also gonna pump the team thanks to Jeskai Ascendancy. So it's gonna be a pretty healthy attack this turn. Stern going to discard in hostilities. Three Goblin tokens going to be coming in, of course. He'll get a fourth one after that, thanks to Goblin Rabble Master. The gang's all here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a pretty healthy attack here. The soldiers are going to deal four. One of those Goblins is going to deal two. So that's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve points of damage by my math. Pretty hard to win by gaining 10 a turn when your opponent's going to be doing 20. <laughs> Accurate. That's just math. Yeah, that's... You don't even have to be good at magic to know that. Yeah. <laughs> See, you can still get back right, out there. Yeah. Yeah, 12 points of damage here. Jeez, that's a lot. Even if Logan loses this game, knowing about the end hostility is at least valuable information. And, you know, it's pretty standard in the token strategy, so not that surprising, but... The information's good. So a quick judge call here. And just clarifying how Goblin Route Master works with token generation that happens to be goblins. Yeah, so hoarding out, Goblin Route Master, Goblin Route Master doesn't give all goblins haste. It gives the goblins, it creates haste. Right. A little complicated because, you know, it's the same token being yeah. generated, but there's just something tied to the Route Master trigger. 
Might as well take a draw step here. Picked up a copy of God's Willing. Still no third land. The upshot here for Logan is, you know, John just played the last card in his hand, that temple. Mm -hmm. And so you at least can play the game of, all right, let's assume that John's just kind of like drawing a land every one. turn. Yeah. You at least have a shot. It's a, a way to formulate a game plan at least. It's going to be really hard in any case to put it mildly, but. Hey, if that's what it takes, sometimes you need your opponent to flood. That's your only chance to win. Looking to tap a mana confluence here for white mana. There's his favorite hot play. He's down to seven. And all he can do is pass. Eternal draw. Is that just guy charm? Yeah, that's that's a killer. That's it. Well, Logan, does, Logan does have stubborn now in his hand. And even if it gets countered, the, the trigger is going to do yep. too much damage. John going to survey the board here very quickly, make sure he doesn't make a mistake. Goblin token going to come in from Rabble Master. Everybody's going to come into the red zone here. You have to imagine. I like attacking with everything here. That's your play? That's my play. John agrees. John's pretty good. And we'll move on to a third game. John's turn able to tie things up here against Logan Mice. Just Guy Tokens, White Blue Heroic, they'll play a third game. And a very, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, play draw biased matchup. And so far, yeah, you can see, even with John having an unchecked uh, at the time, Rabble Master on the draw there, game number one. and. Uh, even with John Mulganing there in game two, the player on the play with a pretty substantial advantage. Well, we're going to watch these players get ready here for game or anything. Think anything changes here, sideboarding-wise? Not really. I mean, the only cards that change in value from John's side, of the, uh, on either side of the table, I feel like, is uh, the red removal in John's deck. It's so much better on the play than on the draw because Logan can quickly grow his creatures to a point where things like Lightning Strike and even Wild Slash don't offer much defense. Uh, with that said, those cards are still so important that I can't imagine most of them getting sideboarded out. So it looks like John is doing some switching around, or is it, he's at least, you know, acting like he's switching some things around? Considering switching some things around, and hostility is being kind of moved around here a little bit. Logan but taking a look at some things, too. I think basically in this matchup, you know, his good cards are good, and his not good cards are not good, and that's... Kind of the summary. Pretty straightforward stuff. I think so. I wonder why we haven't seen that much white blue heroic. What do we think of that as a deck in standard? I think that it's gotten a lot worse in the face of the white red deck becoming prevalent because the place where white blue heroic struggles the most is decks that are inundated with cheap removal and playing against decks that have access to wild slash. Chain to the Rocks, good life-linking threats, can sideboard into some pretty powerful, you know, reactive cards if they want to. I think that matchup's gotten, it's pretty rough, rough for White Blue Heroic. That to me is the biggest thing. I also think it's, it's honestly a really hard deck to play. And I think that a lot of people probably feel the deck is pretty mindless linear deck, you know, shades of Invisible Stalker plus various pants, but this deck's pretty hard to play. You don't have the same margin for error. There's a lot of sequencing. But I think it's the white-red matchup, mostly. Love that. Love that white-red deck still. I know Ben didn't have a great weekend with it. Ben Stark, you know, he's doing some team drafting right now. Still love the splash of black for thoughts he's in Crack and Doom. Just, I feel like it is a deck that was kind of gunned for this weekend, though. This is true, though. I don't really know how you gun for that deck much more than playing Wild Slashes. That, to me, is the, the card that, that tilts that matchup. Okay. Now, there are more Wild Slashes in the room now than there probably would have been a month ago. But For sure. The, the decks in Standard, they're, they're not really linear enough where the sideboarding cards are going to be lights out. You have to look at decks like White Blue Heroic, Mono Red Aggro, where cards like Drown in Sorrow or... Uh, other removal spells become backbreakers. But for the most part, your chess guy tokens in the world, white, red aggro, Obzon, Sultai, you're gonna have some cards that improve the matchup, but it's not gonna go from 
80, 20 to 28. That's not how current standard works. Which I like. I do too. I, I played a lot of standard back when it was, I'm playing Suicide Black against Wildfire. We're just two ships passing the night and there's no point of interaction. It's basically, I dump my hand on the table, you dump yours and we see who wins. Yeah, how, how'd we do? How'd we do? I like this kind of standard a lot more. There's a lot of interaction in this standard. A lot of decisions matter. Sideboard, sideboarding matters. You know, when we were watching Jerry play against Lindy, for example, you know, I remember this pretty well. Just, you know, they're both playing kind of Obzon reanimator decks. Both have Whip in their deck, and they're going back and forth trading resources, all this stuff. And Lindy's a little rusty. Jerry's been playing a lot, obviously. And, you know, they're going back and forth. Corsair's in play, drawing a bunch of cards, Tassigers, all that stuff. And Lindy is starting to catch up, it seems like, a little bit on the board. And then Jerry draws his card for the turn. The next card's Crux of Fate. Lindy just goes, what the hell? Right. And you're just like, yeah, that's what people do now. They play creatures and Wrath together. Not to be all back in my day on you, but back in my day, if you had 14 creatures in your Wrath of God deck, we would have made fun of you. Yep. And now, there's plenty of matches where it's, you know, the stuff is, you just want to outstuff your opponent. You want to out good stuff them. You want to make sure you can catch up when you're losing. And so you play some sweepers alongside your deck of four and five mana creatures. It's just a different world. That Crux of Fate caught Jerry up, let him turn the corner, and then another Crux of Fate later in the game put Jerry in the driver's seat to win the game. Yeah, and he the buried match. him. Yeah. He, he, buried, he buried Matt. And it would look like one of those things where when the decks were laid out, Lindy had almost no chance just yeah. based off the way they were built. And part of that was a couple of copies of Crocs of Fate alongside his deck full of creatures. So we're talk about creatures alongside Wraths. That's what Jeskai Tokens has here for Stern. You can see he's got a copy of Hostilities in his hand alongside Raise the Alarm. So. Right. I mean, sometimes these token decks have Anger of the Gods. Yeah. Your old Raise the Alarm, Whirling Outburst, Anger of the Gods deck. Very synergistic. <laughs> Tried and true. Temple of Triumph here for Stern. We'll go back Mize this way, see if he has a rogue threat. Now, I was actually ahead of the curve on that one, too, because one of my first decks was a red-green beatdown deck with Elvish Archers and Earthquake as the finisher. So I actually... I predate this deck building philosophy by, I mean, we're approaching 20 years now. Ahead of your time. First to market. Ahead of your time. And now that's just how Magic's played. A real genius. So this is kind of your format here. Yep. Birds of Paradise and Hurricane. Play them, <laughs> just, play, just play those together. <laughs> well, the name kind of gives away that you probably shouldn't do that. But. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know. Richard Garfield did try to get you to the finish line yeah. a little bit. There's a bird, there's a hurricane. Right. Don't play them together, please. Typically, Mother Nature would say not a combo. You make the rules. Here's a hero of a rose. We're going to go back Stern's way. And if there's a critique of the, uh, of the tokens ascendancy deck, it's too often the deck doesn't get started until turn three, and this is one of the worst matchups for that to happen. Yeah. And he might not get started until turn four now because there's a Mystic Monastery. Might as well take a draw. One thing to remember about White Blue Heroic, too, it is not soft to Wrath Effects. It has cards like a Giant's Presence. It has cards like Stubborn Denial. It can beat and Hostilities. There is a Giant's Presence. An aggressive use of it. And this is not a good sign for John if Logan feels comfortable enough to just fire this one off. Ordeal. Keep in mind that Seeker is triggering from this as well. These are all prowess triggers that are happening. So this is a pretty good turn. Gets the peel two here. We might just see a double chump block with Raise the Alarm. Yep. Two cards coming here from Ordeal. Here we have and an island. This is, a, this is a pretty good turn for Logan. And I don't know, uh, you know, I didn't get a great look at John's opening hand, but I think, uh, you know, this is your first play to the table. You're going to lose a big percentage of the time against White Blue Heroic. Well, I think this is all a hand to try to get to end hostilities and try to get to resolve. And if he can do that, he feels like he'll be pretty good. But there's no guarantee that that's going to win the game. Well, there's no guarantee that it wins in the game. There's no guarantee it resolves. There's no guarantee he gets to turn number five. Yeah. The draw here is another copy of Just Guy Ascendancy.
There's Mystic Monastery. That's land number four. All of Stern's lands have entered the battlefield tapped. Normally not a huge deal, but in this matchup, it is all about speed. Mm -hmm. We saw Stern defeat Logan in game two. Logan died with seven spells in his hand. And uh, this game has the possibility of shaping up in a similar way. There's Jessica Charm. Logan will take a look. He'll use God's Willing. That, of course, will trigger a rogue, so Hero's going to grow a little bit larger. And we'll get to take a look at the top card. You can see in Logan's hand, he does have a copy of Johnny's Presence. That one is at the ready. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the entire rationale for John having the opening hand that he had and keeping it. And now, uh, it may not be good enough. Likely not good enough. We're going back Mize's way. And with the ordeal of the Heliod, the draw here, I wouldn't be surprised for Logan to try to, you know, diversify his assets a little bit. I think because of the uh, Ajani's presence in hand, he's probably not going to want to touch anything because he needs some weight. Yeah, the attacks. But it would be nice to have a second large creature here as a little bit of a hedge. Two damage will come across. Page is important with this deck, of course. Sternal draw. Another copy of the Hostilities. Second one could be important here. The first one, not going to be all that great. Second one could be pretty good, though. Those turn is a 12. Uh, again, if he is able to get to next turn, it's good. Yeah. I don't even think he has line number five. Looks like he might try to Jeskai Charm in his own turn. Yep. Mize has God's willing yet again. Trigger Heroic gets a scry as well. Take a look at the top card. Goes to the bottom pretty quickly. Going back Mize's way. He'll draw. Looks like Glare of Heresy is what he picked up. I think he might have lethal this Yeah, turn. I think he might, with the uh, with the ordeal here, the hero triggers and the prowess triggers, I think he might be able to put together lethal. That's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Looks like 12 to me. Yeah, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And that's yep. going to do it. Logan Mize is going to win this match here over John Stern. Two games to one. White Blue Heroic will take care of Jeskai Tokens for Mize. He's moving on to day two, Stern's tournament. Unfortunately for him, it's over. And, you know, uh, the takeaway from those.